when we started doing conceptual art, it wasn't called conceptual art. There wasn't any term really for it. Does the term conceptual art designate something substantial? Shift or change or moment or set of possibilities or whatever in art? I suppose the answer is yes in some cases and it also designates you know, farce and false beginnings and ludicrous impostures as, as do most artistic movements. But art language was something with a fairly complicated origin. Um, I met Terry Atkinson in the 1960s and had been myself very interested in, in and influenced by and had worked upon some of the implications of late modernist painting. Atkinson came from a rather different sort of background. Um, I'd been writing or producing these sort of strange little textual fragments for some time. Terry and I, and to a certain extent also Harold Hurrell and Dave Bainbridge, thought we'd produced this, this little journal. And out of that grew a, a conversation with various other artists in America and other parts of the world. We used to write about and occasionally mention what we called an emergency conditional, that conceptual art is theory just in case it's art, and it's art just in case it's theory, and they work just in case. But whether the theory was a theory of art or a theory of something else, some philosophical theory or semantic theory or psychological theory or historical theory or something, it could, it could look, it, look into other, other um, areas which were not necessarily thought appropriate for art to look. So it had a kind of curiosity, it entailed a kind of curiosity um, uh, to the world outside art, perhaps more so in certain ways, certainly more so than, than modernist painting did. Frank Stella had apparently obeyed the, the Greenbergian imperative that what painting had moved towards was, was something defined by its rectangle, and that's what determined what was in a painting. Okay, so it seemed rather interesting to say, okay, well, I can get a mirror, make a mirror which is entirely bounded by its dimensions, and there is very little control one may have over what actually that mirror contains. So it was, a, as it were, pre presenting a paradox to a degree to uh, a high modernist imperative. One of the most popular works in Tate Modern Mirror, which I think Because it's is good for selfies. It's good for selfies. <laughs> got reflections of other works in the background. And, and you, you can, can take your picture and, and you can go like in, that. In a, in, a, in a work installed in the, well, there you go. I mean, it's the, the, the mise en abime till it stings. Other issues arose is the question of, you know, the, whether one can attend to the surface of a mirror or not, in the way that you could attend to the surface of paint. Can you look at it rather than merely past it to what it reflects and so on. It's really interesting to watch professional photographers try and take photographs of mirror because some put drapes over it so you can't see it's a mirror mm. and some try and find a white wall so that it doesn't reflect anything, right? I've never ever seen anyone take a, photo, a professional photographer with a camera like that, stand right in front of it and take a photograph mm. because it's just a photograph of him taking a photograph. Mm. So um, a, mirror, a mirror does depend also, I think, on if I may, mm, if I may, please, uh, on being able on, on being able to kind of walk around it and recognise what it is. It's a mirror. It's you know, if you take a photograph of it, it doesn't look like a mirror. I I I I, I can own up to a, a certain sophistication deficit. Uh, he wasn't very old in relation to when when he was that. twenty, was 19, 20, 20, 20, 20 years, years old. old. I mean, uh, so give him a break. <laughs>